focus remaining. And there we see some more induction. So the inverter was in the middle. So that induction chain of, of running galvanizers is going to continue. So I'm, I'm excited about that razor wall placement, Oz, uh, mm -hmm. because one of my favorite things about the heretic in Grimkin is uh, Wall of Fire. And this is very similar, where he's using it to shut out uh, large amounts of single wound infantry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that automatic one damage for moving through that wall pretty much guarantees that one wound infantry has no chance. Like, fire damage rolls and other things you can hope will be low enough to not matter. But that's just an auto one point of damage. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Asphyxius's feet, however, does bring back models that cannot be damaged, mm -hmm. so it will not be useful there. Uh, and it could actually even fuel the feet in this situation. Yeah. He could run all of his banes into it, killing them. They do have tough, so it could be awkward if he hits all those tough rolls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you do have to be careful with allowing Asphyxius easy ways to kill his own models, because then he can get exactly what he wants out of his feet. A lot of running galvanizers. A lot of running okay. galvanizers, but there's, there's, he, he may just be running, but there's a lot of positioning that goes into these things, as we were saying with the counter charges. So, uh, skilled players will be able to get the maximum efficiency out of that by, by where they decide to put these models. As you can see here, Mr. Allen is being very, very careful. Yep, now it looks like our final Gavitizer has moved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've just got Elimination Servitors left. Uh, I'm going to guess these are going to be mostly moved to block charge lanes uh, mm -hmm. and to be set up so that the next turn, if the Banes do advance around that Razor Wall, that they can aim and shoot, uh, giving them a much more likely chance of hitting. And checking threat ranges again. And of course, that Optifex unit of mechanics, support mechanics, are just going to follow along in the back, mm -hmm. ready to help in any way they need to. They can give models Pathfinder, which is great, mm -hmm. as can Axis with Onslaught. Uh, but sometimes you don't necessarily want to spend the focus on that. So having that unit of mechanics there is very important. Uh, and then of course, they can also give magical weapons, which could have been very yeah. helpful against Ghost Fleet. Uh, in this situation, it's probably not going to do um, not going to do too much with the magic weapons, I would guess. The other thing that this army has a ridiculous amount of is repair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every galvanizer is also effectively a mechanic. Uh, yes, yeah, so anything that you don't kill could very well just return to full health. Yes, uh, and I'm guessing with only that one heavy in there mm -hmm. and the TEP, mm -hmm. that, they'll, that, that there might be some repairing later on, especially if, if, that, if that heavy warjack takes a hit and doesn't quite die, you can bring it right back oh, yes. with a couple yeah. of good repair rolls. It, it'll certainly have all of its systems, uh, and because of the induction mechanic, even if it loses its induction node, mm -hmm. uh, it can even get all of its focus back and, and be running at full efficiency with iron regression. So here we go. The Convergence has made their advance. Let's see what we can do here. Looks like we've got some threat range measuring going on here. Mm -hmm. That could also be spell range. We're getting some of the results put in uh, down here at the bottom. So you guys can catch up on what happened in round one. And that will go live shortly. Check in all the stats on those galvanizers. Make sure he understands entirely what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those out there watching, they are defense 12, armor 16, with 22 boxes. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't make them the most durable models out there, but I mean, they're, they're relatively inexpensive in points, so for their points, they're, they're pretty yeah, solid. Yeah, every one of those models is five points. So yeah. that's how you fit 12 of them into a list. Absolutely. Doesn't leave a lot of room for other stuff, but leaves room for the important things. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're contemplating how exactly best to approach all of these countercharging models. And I talked a lot of, uh, earlier about the positioning 
of the galvanizers and the reflex servers with countercharge, it is just as important for the positioning or as the positioning of these banes as they approach these models. Yeah, um, it it really becomes this huge battle of wits between the two players to see how you can manipulate the battlefield, how you can uh, manipulate your opponent's positioning with how you place these things. Yeah, it's very, very, very important to not let your opponent engage with a Convergence Warjack that can still induct to one that has not activated. Yes. Yeah, it's... it's there's a lot of threat range games going on right now and a lot of, a lot yeah. of positioning and jockeying for that advantage. Yeah. So you, I, you, if, if you're going to have to take hits, you want to force those hits to be far enough out so those focus effectively don't get recycled. Uh, I'm going to guess that this turn is going to be mostly positioning uh, for the Crix player here mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to commit too heavily in his zones at the moment. I think he's going to end up playing the long game and hopefully end up using his, his feet to destroy the tap here. Yeah. Uh, would be my hope for going into this game. Um, so what I would probably do in a situation like this is try and cloud up, see where we can, where we can go on scenario. So start dominating my friendly zone, um, camp a couple focus so that I don't get sprayed by the transmitted emergence projector too, too hard. Uh, and put up a nice cloud wall in front of my stuff, stopping the Galvanizer charges. And hopefully with that, I can force Axis to feed defensively and not get that mm -hmm. additional speed to really be able to yeah. through the clouds. But he's going to have to really position his Banes carefully because <laughs> very, very there, there, a lot of sprays can come out of that transfinite Emergence Projector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he can choose to spray his own models, so even though he cannot see through the clouds, mm -hmm. he can line up those sprays. Uh, with his own reflex servitors or elimination servitors or even the galvanizers. So setting up a cloud wall around this part of the board right here uh, I think would be the best place to do it. And then having Asphyxius walk on in and just tow this little corner right yeah. there. Uh, and what that'll do is it'll really force either Axis, who is here, to move into his zone uh, and you can apply pressure with your models from here. Yeah. And, and then that kind of breaks the game in half, because then you end up with two different kind of forces fighting. And mm -hmm. I think the, the Crix player is advantaged in a situation where the convergence has to spread out. They don't get as much value out of induction. Uh, counter charges get worse the farther apart they are. So if he can force a, a very wide engagement, I think that's the best thing uh, that Darkos could really do here. It does look like a little bit of a little bit of damage was done from the desecrator shooting uh, to these two galvanizers here. Yep. Got that AOE to clip a couple of them, and that does leave behind a scather, which is not going to be particularly relevant to the galvanizers themselves, but it could stop some of those elimination servitors from coming up. Yep. Uh, which are very efficient at killing bane warriors. And here we go. Uh, I think where where these Bane Riders end up is going to be pretty interesting here. Not. It looks like we have walked into a counter charge here from this yep. servitor, and it is declined. So he's he's decided that it's not worth the servitor there to try and kill a Bane Rider. Yep. Uh, that he wants to save for the Bane Thralls. Yeah, the threat of that servitor against those Bane Warrior models mm -hmm. will keep them back. Potentially. It does look like Asphyxius is being a little uh, more timid than I had originally mm -hmm. talked about here. He's trying to stay back. And of course, putting up clouds. Absolutely. He's playing that threat range game. He's, uh, he's really locking down his own zone, though, which is, which is really good. His arc node is trying to stay safe uh, to make sure that when he does need to run forward to channel key spells, that it is not a problem. So we had a question earlier on the chat about the Holden concepting hangout we were doing. Yes. And that has just finished. Yes. And Matt Wilson has drawn an image of Holden based on that that will be being fleshed out further by our concept art team mm -hmm. and creating 
the Hollow Man version of Holden that will come out sometime in the next year, and we'll see ID that before the hand. And that was all decided in our big Battle of Boardsgate event yesterday mm -hmm. that you helped decide. I did, I did. Getting that heretic to that little hut Holden was <laughs> hiding in. He, he did make it there after quite a crazy game that was streamed yesterday. Ah, so to, to jump back into our game here, mm -hmm. we do have some Banes being pretty aggressive over here. And as I said, uh, you can see them swinging quite wide over here. This is very, yep. very close to the board edge. Uh, and, and what that does is it's forcing the Convergence player to spread out. Now, as I was saying earlier, if you can force countercharging models to spread out, it's much harder mm -hmm. for them to cover themselves. It's much harder for them to uh, get efficient charges that they can clear themselves or clear other models from engagement, which is what prevents countercharges. So we did just check a countercharge there. He was in range and it was declined once again, probably because he doesn't want his galvanizer to go up there and then get charged by other banes. Yep. So even if he does kill this bane thrall here, uh, several of these other ones that were located about here could then charge in and uh, and clear him out and get a get a bane or get a, a galvanizer when currently he has none in threat range. So he scored a hit and killed a reflex server there. And part of the reason he had to flank those bane warriors out there was that razor wall. Yes, absolutely. He he did have to maneuver around that wall. And if you see, we have some of the Bane Riders moving up behind it. They're not nearly as threatened by it. It only does one damage. They have multiple wounds. It's not an issue. Not an issue. But I, I do see these, these uh, Elimination Servitors here are indeed going to be able to aim next turn and mm -hmm. pepper these Bane Warriors with uh, quite a few puncturing shots. So. And none of their prowling stealth is affecting anything that's not inside a forest or a cloud. Correct. Correct. So those... Those couple out in the front, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek Wraith is moving up. I imagine uh, he's going to use Beyond Death, which I'm not sure is too, too relevant here. And the Kinker Worm hides behind the cloud wall. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, no. He's giving it the good old classic Pagani there. Yeah, he's... <laughs> He's keeping that canker worm away from that battle engine. Yep, yep. He doesn't want to lose any models that he doesn't have to to the battle engine. Um, but he does have that one green Bane Rider, which I will highlight here in just a moment. So this one right here is definitely up there to bait that Transfinite Emergence protect Projector to come on up mm -hmm. and try and shoot through the clouds, because if he does, he gets that vengeance we were talking about, which yep. really extends the yep. threat range of those Bane Riders. And the Crix player's turn is in. We are into the bottom of round two. This game is blazing fast. Well, this is Iron Gauntlet. Absolutely. This is, this is our veteran and elite players. Mm -hmm. Players that have been playing for a long, long time and playing a lot of games, tuning their armies. So as we see this Bane army, it's kind of splitting in half. So you have Asphyxius' battle group down here at the bottom. And then you've got uh, this giant contingent of Banes up on the north half of the board. Uh, and what that's going to do, once again, we were talking about splitting stuff. I'm going to guess that we're going to see a scenario play next turn from Asphyxius. He's going to move up into the zone. He's going to start dominating his own zone for points. Uh, and then that's going to force Axis to shift to the bottom with his more heavy hitting stuff. But he's still got the full unit of Bane Riders and the full unit of Bane Warriors mm -hmm. going for his opponent's zone. Uh, so... Hopefully, I think his plan is to really spread the resources thin to that convergence player. We've got some proxy bases coming out to see if models can fit. Looks like we're measuring Axis's movement here to see how far yep. forward he can get. He could be making a feet play here with Axis, trying to get forward, feed on all those Banes. They can't charge then, uh, and then he can really press into them and not worry too, too much about uh, reprisal. Yeah, Axis' feet, um, enemy models currently in it suffer minus two speed and strength, and friendly models gain plus two speed and strength. So yes. that'll also, to a certain extent, hamper that hitting power of those melee-focused Bane models. Mm -hmm. A lot of careful measuring going on over there, hiding behind that little wall. Yep. It does look like they're checking an axis movement. And then now options for feet range are being yep. checked. Yes. So I, I feel like he's 
uh, Mr. Allen here is seeing quite a bit of pressure applied to this top scenario point. There's a lot of models up there, so if he yep. can feet, get the advantage on the top half, get through that very quickly, and then he can swing his army around to the bottom half of the board. That can that can really give him a huge advantage. Uh, but he needs to be very careful because once his feet is gone, Asphyxius then kind of has free reign with his feet. Mm -hmm. Whereas his feet will buy him a turn because those models cannot charge. Asphyxius's feet requires models to charge yeah. uh, to make attacks. But like you said so. earlier, every every model that dies on the Crick side is potentially <laughs> fuel for that feat. Absolutely. Uh, you're, you're giving ammo to your opponent. You have to give it to him. I mean, you do, you do, but, but using your feet early like this could be detrimental because it is sort of a get-out-of-jail-free card for one round against mm -hmm. Asphyxius's feet. So we're going we're gonna to see if he commits to this here. They're currently calculating the threat ranges of these Bane Riders. That makes them... Yep. So he's checking the threat range of those Bane Riders to make sure they're not within 8, which is their threat range after the feat. Um, we'll see if Vengeance comes into play here. Perhaps they could uh, get a 3-inch advance from Vengeance if one of them is damaged, and that could mess up the entire calculation that just happened. Mm -hmm. Bumping it up to 11 inches instead of just 8. And now we're, we're getting Someone in the chat stats. is um, mentioning the change from Steamroller 2016 to tr Steamroller 2017 in that there is not quite as many placeable effects for measuring ranges and checking proxies and all Absolutely. that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So next year's Iron Gauntlet will look a little bit different than some of the games that have run today. Uh, yes. Measurements like what we're just done are still certainly possible under the new rules. Yes. But they just would have had to pick up uh, that back proxy base that's yeah. showing where he makes the turn uh, for his advance there. So it removes a little bit of the clutter and makes it a little prettier for everyone else. All right. And, so and Razor Wall was not upkept, so it is gone over there. Yep, and it looks like we are now allocating focus. So there we go. We've got one focus on essentially either side of this obstruction, uh, which will induct all of the warjacks here and allow them all to, to function. We're going to try to start thinning down those ranks of Bane Warriors with some Elimination Servitors. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need sevens to hit here, so he's got about a 50-50 here. Our tough check was failed, so our first Bane Warrior has passed. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Oz was saying just a moment ago, that is the first model that can be feeded back from Asphyxius. Yep. You're loading bullets in that gun every time you kill a model. So I, I do see a lot of work coming out of these elimination servitors over turn after turn. Mm -hmm. So This is our, our galvanizer that was replaced here is now moving on up. Uh, looks like our elimination servitor aimed and is now shooting. Another failed tough check. Mm -hmm. Two bullets loaded. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Axis is moving forward now. It does look like it's feet time. Yeah. The, the additional plus two speed on, on Axis' feet affects all models in his control area. So it will affect the Elimination Servitors. It will mm -hmm. affect the Reflex Servitors. Uh, it's really going to let him dig deep into this, this top flank. Yeah, uh, and allowing those Elimination Servitors to move that much farther forward before they take their shots is potentially very handy. So he is marking the models that are not in his feet because there are significantly less yes. than that <laughs> yes. than those that are. Most of those Bane Warriors on that north side are in the feet. He caught the entire unit of riders, so that'll be good for him. Looks like he's casting Razor Wall again. Yep, yep. So just moving it to a more advantageous position for the next turn. 
which does, uh, with that kind of placement, it looks like he's going to be moving into the, the middle area of the board here. Uh, so this was a run right here, because he didn't want the, the reflex servitor to die, by because when they, when they attack, they explode whether or mm -hmm. not they hit their attacks. So he is using these as sort of a, a speed bump against these banes, and then combining that with his razor wall, he's really going to be able to limit his opponent's mobility. Uh, and it does look like he is now moving for a scenario play. Asphyxius kind of gave up the initiative that he could have had by scoring on his opponent's turn, or in the very least uh, forcing him into his own zone by not moving up last turn. So the Convergence player will be ahead on scenario points here. And here we go. We've got some Illumination Servitors. Working on Bane Warriors. Not working too hard. Yeah, and I think those reflex servitors moving to just get in the way of the Bane Warriors was probably more, more valuable than trying to blow them up. Well, yeah, so it's an unboosted POW 14. Uh, I believe their armor 18. So it's, it's very unlikely that they roll the 9 to actually kill the yeah. Bane Yeah, and you guarantee the that there's no chance that Vengeance can go off. Correct, correct. Uh, and the Vengeance could be very, very bad, as we discussed earlier. Yeah. It could get three to five Bane Riders onto Axis, which I don't think is what he's looking for here. Um, there we go. So one Galvanizer just killed one of the Bane Warriors, and they're going to continue advancing. Uh, and with this negative speed, and they cannot charge on these Bane Warriors, they're very, very slow. Mm -hmm. they, they only get to move three inches next turn, and they have yep. one-inch melee range. Um, yeah. Still keeping with this very careful positioning, making sure all of his charge lanes are open. Uh, so anything that could come up and get in the way and engage and attack these galvanizers will get charged by other galvanizers if all of the positioning works out as planned. So the chat's mentioning the newly improved CID battle engine for convergence. And Oddly enough, it didn't really change in that. I, I do like your pun of using oddly enough uh -huh. there. Uh-huh. I did that uh, just for you. Because its its hit points went from 22 to an odd number of 23, which is also a prime number. Uh-huh. Because there's lots so. of primes and odd numbers inside the convergence. So many, 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 many players, and internally, we were very happy with where the transfinite emergence projector was sitting at power level-wise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we, we noticed that we had not given its health points a prime number value, so we did that. Yes. Yes, indeed. All right, so our inverter moved up here to really start threatening the, the second unit of Bane Riders that was not caught in the feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine at the moment it is in uh, prime charge range of those models. So I'm going to guess that he is going to end up moving galvanizers in front of it to keep it protected. But we'll see how that works out here. And this Reflex Servitor is trying to attack some Bane Warriors. Yes, and just to, to kind of show what I'm talking about here, Axis is up here. These Bane Riders should be outside of the feet. So they can still charge, they can still do all this stuff. And with Ghostly, they're going to be able to move through all of that terrain all mm -hmm. the way right up here. So with these Galvanizers coming on up, yep, there we go, just as I was talking about. The Galvanizers are moving in the way here, removing that charge bonus yep. uh, by getting close enough to them here. Uh, and I would also imagine that we're going to get a lot of Galvanizers kind of tucked in behind them so that when things do walk up to try and clear the jams uh, and threaten those, that we get those, those counter charges we've been talking about. And whether that be the Reflex Servitors or whether that be other Galvanizers. And this is another run from this Reflex Servitor here. And... The most important thing about that countercharge on those Galvanizers is it's a field marshal, not a spell or an ability that has a range. Oh, yes. It's it is so Warjacks in the battle group. So they don't have to be in the control range. They don't have to be. They could be anywhere on the table, and they're still mm -hmm. in that battle group, so they still gain countercharge. So he can throw them out there and basically sacrifice them to be counterchargers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if they can never get focus ever again, and they might not do a lot, but... That, that threat will always still be there. So we did just have... We 
We did just have a uh, an elimination server run into a caustic mist cloud, so it will be corroded just in a moment here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they are resolving scather damage, which yep. was left behind by the desecrator. Actually, it's not actually called scather anymore. It is a, a new version because we changed this in in the CID cycle yeah, to be as, a new version. It's being related to the Bane theme. The Desecrator got a little bit of a tweak in that CID process. And it's too. now called Void Field, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's very similar to Scatter in that it does one damage if you enter or end your movement in it, but it only affects living models now. Yep. Well, actually, I think it's non-undead, yeah, so it, it does it affect it Construct. Not it, does not, it does not hurt the Bane models mm -hmm. that it's helping out mm -hmm. to throw that out there. And that was a community request to change uh, straight out of the CID forums. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a great change. Great change because it didn't make much sense to have a warjack that's powered up by Banes, that's really uh, themed with them, then cut off huge portions of the board. Yeah. So especially if you miss that deviation and it drifts towards you, and now all your charge lanes are blocked by yep, yep. by a, a burning cloud of up all, horrible stuff. All Actually, your own not stuff. a cloud, <laughs> just an area on the ground. A horrible not cloud. Yes. All right. Our transmitted emergence projector is walking up. And there's going to be a lot of measuring with this spray template here, would be my guess, yep. to try and figure out where exactly the angles are and the different attacks that he could make. But he's going to try and figure out the best way to program that thing by its server placement. Boop, boop, beep. I, I imagine it makes little beepy noises all the time. I, I, I like to think of it as an abacus and making clacking and clicking Clack sounds right. constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of the design process, and this, this goes back years and years and years, of course, part of the design process, the fun of making that thing was trying to figure out exactly how to make it that programmable machine without making it super, super complicated yep. or weird. And I, I think the, the servitor placements are a very interesting portion of that. Mm -hmm. All right, our judge, uh, Jackson Wood here, is coming in. And he's looking like he does not hit his own model with his spray. And he's oh, going he's triple damage. All damage. Holy moly. That objective is never going to see this coming. Yeah. We've scored a hit on the objective here, and then he's going to get five dice of damage. Woo! Five dice. That is a heck of a roll for 17 that, damage, killing that it in one just hit. just popped that objective. So by removing that objective, he's going to remove a very large portion of that cloud wall that Asphyxius is capable of making, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to become a fast problem for Asphyxius. That scenario play we were talking about, now a lot less likely to happen. Uh, it's going to be yep. a lot less safe. It's going to leave him a lot less places to hide. But he did get Axis' feet out of the way, and it looks like he's not going to take too, too much damage here uh, from that feet. So he's not going to take that Alpha Strike. He's not going to get really, really punished by it. Yeah, that Galvanizer just ran to engage. These guys are walking. Yep, and these guys just look to be positioning. They're measuring the feet range for that elimination server. Yep. So he's just going to wander six inches. He doesn't have too much to shoot anyway. Here's his Optifex uh, director. Some of the convergence names are a little bit of a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. well, besides the Transfinite Emergence Projector, what's your favorite name? of any convergence model? Uh, I think it's the inverter. The inverter? Because it just, it uses one of its weapons to just change your position and quite quite to possibly to just flip you upside down. <laughs> just, it's a much, much straightforward direct name. It, it, it inverts, inverts things. people. <laughs> it takes things and it turns them upside down or I'm turns uh, them inside out, I guess. Yeah. If you hit it hard enough. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the algorithmic dispersion opt effects. I wasn't going to say that one out loud because I was afraid I might uh, <laughs> get, get half of its initials uh, if I even tried its initials wrong and then half of its pronunciation off. I, d I don't know why I like that one so much. I, think it's just I do love that model, though, with that gigantic stick he's got. Looks uh, like an old-timey microphone. I always like the, uh, the analogy that he is Elvis because mm -hmm. he's got like the hips going mm -hmm. and that big old microphone. It's sweet. All right. So Asphyxius now is starting up his next turn. Uh, he's, he's checking control ranges. He's checking... Uh, I think he's trying to see if he can feed on the, the TEP or not. But he's got to be real careful about where he ends up using that feed. Mm -hmm. so. and, and besides giving him a lot of dice on damage, he also gave himself a bit of a buffer with those servitors placing them like that. 
And you know, I was actually completely wrong about uh, Axis's feet. Uh, I was actually quite wrong about Axis's feet. It is currently an Axis control area, except for minus two speed and cannot charge. So oh. if Asphyxius returns those models to play, they will be then able to charge still. In, yeah. So with that in mind, there are uh, some exciting options here. I got myself all happy over here mm -hmm. now. So Asphyxius could, and this uh, kind of explains uh, Mr. Allen's placement here around, around Axis, but Asphyxius could move this direction. Actually, I think Asphyxius is more about right here behind his arm. Oh, no. So Asphyxius could end up moving right up to about here, feet models here, and then charge. So if he can clear any of those Warjacks out of the way uh, in this area right here, he could open up a, a lane to Axis. But I think the safer play is going to end up being moving this direction, feet guys here, and charge into this Transfinite Emergence mm -hmm. Projector uh, to really try and stop the attrition game at the Axis player here. Uh, when you use Axis's feet and you kill three Bane Warriors, that's not a great feeling. It's not a great feeling. So yeah. I, I'm a little worried about the Axis player at the moment. They could have got a lot more value out of that feat, uh, perhaps by holding it a turn. But we'll see. Yeah, how and he's going to start going. cleaning up those servitors that are in the way of his, of his movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we talked about uh, spacing here, right? So like this galvanizer right here is spaced very well for this one in front of it. Yep. Uh, anything that walks up to this one can get countercharged by this guy moving yep. either here or there. And the exact same thing pretty much for the one right below it, it yep. looks like. And we've got the same situation here. And then depending on how crazy we get, if this guy ends up over here somewhere, you've got this one covering this galvanizer. So as we mm -hmm. said, like positioning is very important. Uh, this galvanizer is also covering here and here. So there's, there's uh, a lot of layering and a lot of uh, very excellent positioning going on down at the bottom. Uh, up here at the top, it looks like there's um, a little less going on on this top half of the board in this area. There's going to be, I would guess, some Banes are going to run around this direction. They have Ghostly, so they can go over that wall. Uh, we're going to have to see how all this pans out. But the counter charges from the Galvanizers are especially potent this turn because they do have plus two strength from Axis's feet. Mm -hmm. So there will be power 14, giving them very, very good chances at killing uh, killing the different uh, Bane, Bane Riders. Yeah. Scooching. Yep, yep. we got some Bane Riders race. scooching around. Looks like uh, this top one here was used to just engage some models so there won't be any yeah. counter charges later. Those two Galvanizers are not counter charging. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we're going to clear out some of the jam here. And hopefully, um, this will let Asphyxius to uh, let, let Asphyxius advance with these Bane Warriors and be a little mm -hmm. more aggressive here. So. so he's freed up his models, but he did have to use attacks, so those models will be moving to attack. Correct, correct. And I think this is very much worth it uh, for the Axis player here. If you can use two or three of your free servitors to tie up a 20-point unit of Bane mm -hmm. Riders for a turn, mm -hmm. that is all the value you could ever have hoped from that from those models. So, so it looks like impact. the... Well, not an impact, because he couldn't charge from the feet, but he just gets oh, to attack with his yeah. mount when he doesn't charge. Yeah, he just kicked it with the horse hooves. Uh, yeah, so he, he horsey kicked a servitor, and then I believe he said that he just put five damage onto... Uh, onto the Galvanizer over there. Uh, and then the reposition. Cavalry, cavalry do have reposition three, so this is really going to be great uh, for Mr. Whaley here as he can engage all of these models and stop them from countercharging. Mm -hmm. So it looks like he did indeed get the engage on the inverter, so that's really going to allow him to position the and south half of the And he's repositioning the rest of his, his Bane Rider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even though they couldn't use their normal movement because they made attacks to clear the units that were interfering with them, they can mm -hmm. still reposition a little bit. So I, I find this this positioning right here to be interesting. This one right here. He has uh, actually blocked his own line of sight there. Mm -hmm. Like I won't be able to see through the forest. I won't be able to see through the cloud. Uh, that could be a misplay. We'll see We'll see how that ends up playing out in later in this game. So he's going to run some Bane Warriors, it sounds like. And they're they're really slow. <laughs> they're they're moving their massive three inches. Well, they're running. They're they're running they their massive six up inches. To six inches. Trying to engage. Look at these these blazing fast undead galvanizers, undead warriors here. They do have one inch melee range, so they're uh, a little better against 
these galvanizers that can counter charge than other things. Right up to that razor wall. Sure, sure. I am not really sure why there's uh, there's no counter charger going on here. Oh, here we go. I think he's uh, deciding. Yep. Here we go. Yes, he is now deciding yep. about the counter charges. Clock has flipped. This galvanizer right here can easily get some free bane fells by going either there or there. Uh, he, he's safe to do this because they cannot charge. So they've declared the press forward order, so mm -hmm. they have to run. Yep. Uh, or advance, I guess, and forfeit their combat action. But either way, they're not making attacks. So this counter charge is very safe, whereas a lot of the times when units are activating, it can be difficult to, to score good counter charges because when they move up, you move up your model, and the rest of them can just charge you instead of running. Mm -hmm. so and he's the, trying to get rid of that Bane Warrior unit leader. Yes. To complicate <coughs> positioning yeah, so if for he the can, promotion. If he can take out that guy in the middle of an activation, it, it does force some, some weird choices for the Asphyxious player. Uh, the score, I believe, is one for Axis, because he should have dominated his zone in the last turn. And the bands are continuing to move up. Everyone's staying in command range. I don't believe we've had any mini feats going on just yet for the band warriors here. It does look like a few of the band thralls are going to have been able to make attacks. Uh, we had one that was unaffected by the feat. He puts about seven damage on the Galvanizer. That There's mighty Soul Trapper. Trapper. Oh, yes. That Soul Trapper's going to win the game. <laughs> I mean, a run to contest can be very powerful from mm -hmm. a one-point model. Uh, honestly, just scoring the zone itself can be very powerful from a one-point model. Oh, Convergence has gone up to two points. He must have been in his own zone at the end of round two. Interesting. Oh, no, we got the objective. That's where the second point came from. Yeah, he, he destroyed the objective. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that scaler template does need to be removed, uh, as does that cloud effect, which should be removed after the models um, have been either destroyed or move off of it. We've talked a lot about positioning and how important it is in this game. Uh, these Banes, tying up all these counter charges right here, really open up all of these models to being able to go this way without too much worry. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very, very good positioning on those Bane Riders to the top of the board. He's moving some of his non-feet affected Bane Warriors at the bottom. Correct, yes. And these models can charge and activate completely normally. Um, so it does look like that Bane right there just engaged both of these. Uh, and we were talking about positioning, right? And how these galvanizers need to cover each other and all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. This galvanizer could not get to this Bane thrall. Mm -hmm. So he was able to engage these guys and not uh, trigger free charges here. So this one ran here to block this counter charge. So this is some mm -hmm. amazing positioning coming out yeah. on these Bane Warriors here to really stop, to really stop the uh, the galvanizers from being able to efficiently and properly cover each other. Um, yeah, it looks like the convergence player chose not. He chose not to to countercharge the one that was running. Yes, because it because he do wants a lot to try and to get the one it. that charges was, later. I would yes. imagine he was hoping that that was not a attempt to bait him into doing that. So yes. That yes, to reposition something else later. And it looks like the rest of the unit's just going to kind of pile in behind, fill on up, and get ready to use their uh, once-per-game ability to return models to their unit in just a little bit here. So it does look like the Bane Thrall 
or the Bane Warrior, I'm sorry, that is in the rubble is out of command. Uh, so he will not in, uh, be able to make attacks. And here we go, our first charge attack here. Perhaps even our only charge attack. Ooh, that is a heck of a damage roll. Doing 15 damage to the one on the Galvanizer. Which, because of the, the damage grades on Convergence Warjax, is not as good as it could have been against other things. They have their damage, uh, their, their, not aspects, their systems yeah. are very spread out along the bottom of their card. Yeah. Uh, so that actually is not going to take out any systems on that Galvanizer. Oh, I lied, actually. I think that is going to take out the Induction Node. Oh, no, not quite. Not quite. So there's actually zero systems out on that Galvanizer. Uh, there's a couple more Banes. Just putting some attacks into these, these front couple Galvanizers here. Um... <laughs> the exact opposite of the damage roll I was talking about. That one was not so great. And Convergence did remove one model from over there. Yes, yeah, yeah. So a couple of the warriors have died. But I think, um, I think we're going to be a little conservative with our mini feats here. And we've got questions if anybody's going to be playing Grimkin today in the stream. Uh, we do have one Grimkin player, Tom Kwan, is playing Grimkin in Iron Gauntlet. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not he makes it to the stream, we do not know. Um, either way, I will be having a staff game tomorrow near the end of Lock and Load where I will be playing Grimkin on stream. Uh, and our Desecrator is advancing and kind of giving it to one of these Galvanizers here, doing some damage. Looks like we're on our third attack here. Little, little critical shred, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is uh, never to be relied on. Oh, and then roll an 11 for damage, so no shred attack. But he, uh, but he got it all done there. So this is excellent. So this has really opened up uh, the Bane, the Bane Rider unit. Oh, here we go, Canker Worm, is charging in there. Uh, remember that those clouds out there at the moment were placeholders for the previous round's clouds. So they're not actually there at the moment. Um, so we're charging in with an armor-piercing canker worm. He did his damage, and then now he's going to scuttle, or reposition is the, the new terminology for yeah. it. Uh, and that is his bond with asphyxias. So they're checking at the moment the engagement rules uh, for out of out of formation models. Yeah, and out, being out of formation turns off some things, but does not turn off your Dark Shroud. Correct. Which is why that model went there. Checking damage on some conversions Warjax. Mm -hmm. It does look like he's trying to figure out what exactly he can finish off with these Bane Riders. Mm -hmm. And a couple of those have not even been scratched yet. Uh, many of them have not. I think only two of them have actually taken damage. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're down, what are we down, two, three galvanizers so far? So there's still a lot of them to chew through. Yeah. Oh, we're... we're um, They're correcting a scather correcting, damage that was yeah. missed. That was one of the models that moved through that desecrator shot and took mm -hmm. a point of damage. So here we go, the Bane Riders are charging. They have ghostly, so they do not draw free strikes from these galvanizers as they go past, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the... And they don't mm, care about rough terrain either. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. But that's one of the more powerful things uh, available to Banes is this ghostly. It really just lets them go anywhere they want. Yep. And with the Bane Riders, that reform and or that, uh, that vengeance move can really get them into weird places that you don't... Well, and it can also, they can if, if you're hitting a heavy target that the Bane Riders can't quite take out themselves, they can clear out of the way with that reposition. Correct. And not take the free strikes, and then possibly a second unit of Bane Riders or something else can follow up behind and finish it off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we are looking pretty dead even on time here. Aaron has gone first, so the fact that he is a little behind is fine. Like, mm -hmm. he's a whole turn ahead. Uh, but it's looking like this game is going to go, go long. I'm going to guess there's not going to be many assassinations coming out here. Uh, yeah. unless, unless his Axis decides he wants to brave the Asphyxia's feet, uh, I'm going to yeah. guess this game is going to come down to attrition in scenario. Okay. 
So that number of galvanizers does get a little confusing. We've got some <laughs> conversations back and forth about which damage roll applied to which galvanizer. Yes. Uh, and Aaron Allen here does have them numbered on the back of the card, on the back of the models. Yeah, uh, so. he's got them all numbered, and he's got damage, a damage grid specific card because he only really needs a reference for one. Another Most galvanizer has gone down. Yep. And that was our third galvanizer death, yep. according to our table judge here. Yep, so Jackson's there telling us there are still nine out there. There are nine left out there. So I wouldn't count them all out just yet. Yep, still pretty good numbers. And here we go. So let's, uh, let's take a little talk about what we think is going to happen next turn. This, uh, this Transfinite Emergence Projector is in a great position right now. It's not going to get engaged. It's yeah. not going to... It was well protected. It was well protected. It's not going to die it's this turn. Measuring its threat ranges yep. right now. So that's how far it can walk, shown on the stream right there. And then it can spray 10 inches from there. So Sphyxius has to be pretty careful about this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it can do a lot of damage to a caster, especially if he doesn't have any focus. Uh, so I'm going to guess that he's going to sit on some focus. Hopefully he walks up into his zone to start dominating. Um, but this, this zone up here, this zone doesn't have a whole lot of Banes in it. So it's got maybe yeah. three Bane Warriors, maybe four. Uh, there's a Rider around like one, the two, corner. three, four Bane Warriors, and there's a Rider right here. So this, I think, is going to be a pretty easy cleanup yeah. uh, for Axis to continue scoring control points. And that's really going to put the pressure on to Asphyxius here to, mm -hmm. to either commit more to control or to contest that zone or to really start trying to ramp up his point scoring uh, yeah. and stop Convergence from contesting his zone so he can score on both players' turns. Uh, but there's a lot of little servitors down here, like this little guy right here, this little guy right here, and we've got some opt effects directive that after next turn could totally be in range to run in, into the zone. So I think it's going to be very difficult uh, for Trix to win on scenario at this point. I think mm -hmm. that the Convergence player should be really looking forward uh, on how they want to attempt that, uh, uh, force, force the Trix player into bad peace trades and kind of throwing away models to contest zones. And that might be a way that he can gain an advantage on attrition here. Yep, and trying to rebuild that cloud wall to block line of sight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Cause sprays do ignore cover and concealment, but they don't entirely ignore line of sight. Uh, correct, correct. But they're not blocked by these clouds. Uh, though you cannot see through them to target models, you can spray something in front of the clouds yeah. and they will continue yeah. through them. So he'll have to position his own models Mm -hmm. to get his uh, vectors, as it were, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> to get those lines for those sprays where he wants them. Uh, yes, and it can be very difficult with the TEP to have models in proper places so that, say, if you want to do a spray asphyxius twice, because this thing gets multiple attacks, mm -hmm. it can be very difficult to position models where you can spray him multiple times and not kill your own model that's letting you make the attacks. Yep. So yep. this is just one of the, the complexities of the TEP here. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron Allen here is wondering about the threat range for the melee for both the Cankerworm and the Desecrator here. It does look like he is looking to push up his TEP just a little bit here. Yeah. There's some talk in the chat about uh, people's surprise of the composition of the Crick's army, that there's no Wraith mm -hmm. engine in there to give them the armor bonus. Mm -hmm. But in this fight against basically no real shooting, a little bit of shooting, but not well, like got the mass TEP. shooting. But it's not super helpful against that model. Like it's, it can yeah. get so many damage dice that yeah. it's... It's not super, super great there. Um, I, I think the Asphyxius army is built for pure aggression, mm -hmm. whereas it's not really worried about surviving attacks. It's really, I think, just trying to put out so much pressure and so much aggression and so much damage uh, that things like this many galvanizers, this amount of boxes, not a problem for this list. Yep. Uh, if you run into a Harkovich or a, uh, a Karchev list running 6-8, 10 Cotor heavies, this list can chew through that. And yeah. the, the Wraith engine is not particularly great in any of those matchups. So I'm, I'm not particularly surprised to see this type of list composition, especially in a format like Iron Gauntlet, yeah. where you can have three lists and you can really tailor your lists for what you want the matchups to be. This list also is interesting because there's been some conversations in some areas and some communities about Warjack spam being the only way to play. A lot of players mm -hmm. just bulking up on, on Warjacks. Mm -hmm. But this Crick's army has a few warjacks in it, but not a lot. It's mostly infantry. It's got two lights and a heavy, and it can definitely punch hard enough mm -hmm. to destroy very large amounts of warjacks. Yeah. So I, I expect this new release of Dark Hosts to really 
uh, push forward and uh, further the value of infantry in mm -hmm. the game. Looks like the players are rules referencing. It does look like we've gone to the tank a little bit here. Our, our Axis player here is assessing options, really, really thinking about what he wants to get done this turn, uh, which I cannot stress enough from a competitive standpoint. Like, really taking your time and figuring out what you need to do uh, is way, way better than just kind of rushing into it and really... Yeah, if you, just, if you still have half an hour on your clock, you're, yeah. you're not in any kind of hurry. And the first two rounds of this game went by blazing fast. Yeah. I think one player spent like 14 minutes on his first two turns combined, and, and the other player spent about 10. Yeah, so. pri primarily melee armies facing off against each other. There's going to be a, just a lot of positioning, and that's, that's not as difficult as judging gun ranges. And, and looking out for, for these giant threat range assassinations that exist in some mm -hmm. places uh, can really take a lot of mental load. But in, in matches like this, everything's pretty straightforward in terms yeah. of, of threat ranges and trickiness. So... So a uh, confirmation right there about what Asphyxius's feet can return to the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the weird interactions of this theme force with Asphyxius 2 specifically is um, the Bane unit attachment. Yeah. Their mini feet uh, returns models to play. Yes. And Asphyxius's feet also returns models to play. So in a situation like right now, if uh, the Asphyxius player decided to use all of their Voidbringer mini feats, they could return all of the dead models to play. And then that would empty out but the he, pool for their <laughs> But feet, then he yeah. couldn't feed. So that was uh, one of my favorite interactions that was brought up in CID that we, we certainly left in the game uh, because it's, it's, it's kind of cheeky and funny. And it's, it's certainly something to be aware of. And uh, sort of the flip side of it is after Asphyxius's feet, it's going to, I would imagine, remove them all from play. Meaning you could they not leave play at the end of the they turn. They leave play. Oh, so you could return. They're not so so they can okay. be returned by okay. the Bane Warrior command attachments. The next turn. Mini feed, yes. Mm -hmm. So the order of those operations really matters. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So that's uh that's kind of an interesting idea to think about when you're playing lists with multiple units of Bane Warriors and Asphyxius too. Looks like one of our elimination servitors has missed an attack here. Axis is activating here. Our razor wall was not up kept up there. If you see, there's a, yep. a nice razor, razor wall. Gone. Razor wall sized hole about right here. Yep. <laughs> We've cast an unstoppable force here, which is going to give them all bulldoze. Mm -hmm. Which would be a great way to clear out the, uh, the zone up there on the top and continue scoring. Control Axis points. has a surprising amount of movement shenanigans for mm -hmm. a beat stick melee caster. Yeah, there's a, a lot of diversity in this caster. He's got a really strong scenario presence with unstoppable force and counter charge. Uh, he can onslaught, so he can deal with terrain very well, mm -hmm. which gives all charging models Pathfinder. Uh, and then he himself has beat back, so he can do some really weird things with like counter charge at the end of someone's turn himself, and then just get up there. He and can clear zones without killing models effectively. Yep, he does have beat back as well and double strike. Yeah. So he can, he can do a lot of really interesting and unique plays uh, that a lot of other casters can't really pull off. So it looks like we just bulldozed one Bane out of the zone, and then the Galvanizer is going to move on up here, and is going to attack that same Bane Warrior that it pushed. Uh, I'm going to guess that at some point soon we're going to see uh, what I love to refer to as Fort Harbinger, which Axis can't quite do, but mm -hmm. I'm going to guess we're going to see a line of models line up along this zone like this yep. to really try and secure it and stop uh, Banes and Bane Riders, etc., from getting into the zone to try and score a point on Asphyxius's turn instead of on his own, or in addition to his own turn. So we will see how these bulldozers end up going uh, and what exactly is accomplished this turn. But I would be pretty surprised if something like that did not end up happening here. So it looks like that Bane Warrior that was attacked by the previous Galvanizer was uh, tough. So, mm -hmm. so he survived that hit. We have the next Galvanizer walked up, bumped that Bane Warrior back, hits him again. Kills him. He failed the tough check there. Got 
Got some tactics questions in the chat for you. But, sure. But that's what Facebooks are for. That's what Facebooks are for? Yeah. Oh, great. You I belong think. to every single community Facebook page, right? Uh, probably. Yeah. Probably. And you only get tagged about uh, 100 <laughs> times a day on Facebook. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But what, what were the tactics questions? He was um, asking you about your uh, uses of Allegiant Monks in uh, Harbinger oh. and themes. <sighs> Well, that is quite off topic. Yeah, that's a big. <laughs> that's the other thing I was I was I was bringing that up for is that 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 is quite off a, topic. We could we could go into long discussions on that, but then we we ignore all the action on screen here. Absolutely. Oh, okay. And I've just been told that I should try and pronounce this name so that oh. uh, these people know we're talking about them. Indeed. And of course. It's a hard name to pronounce. That that looks like it was by uh, Barsk Manon, that question. Indeed. So well, I don't know if your first name is Barsk or your last name is Barsk. Or, or perhaps or Manon. Whatever. But, um, Either uh, way, it's a be, sweet name. But, but yeah. That is a sweet name. But poke, poke Mr. Pagani on one of the various <laughs> social medias that he's constantly on. Uh, to give you the, the two-second version, uh, Allegiance of the Order of the Fist are quite amazing with Harbinger particularly with awe and martyrdom mm -hmm. and shifting stands. Oh, no. Stands, okay, he's stands. clarifying. He was asking when they'll be in a theme so that ah. you can take them with Harbinger. Uh, sooner well, rather than later, yeah, I believe, we'll, is the answer here. You, you will hear about that in the future. Any, any, any theme for stuff. We are discussing some stuff really soon. Let me look across the room. It looks like... It should already be going here. Yes, so we are doing a CID Live Hangout right now with Souls and... Hungerford and Jack, maybe? Mm -hmm. And they are talking about the stuff that's currently in CID right now. I think specifically the Mercs in Theme Forces. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Souls mm -hmm. had a big stack of Theme Force stuff that he wanted to talk over with people. Some stuff that no one even knows about, like a Theme lot Forces of stuff. that might be coming earlier than people expect them. So Absolutely. Uh, hopefully some of the people in that hangout over there will be talking about this stuff on Facebook and Twitter and letting you guys know what's going on. If not, then that's a really good reason to come to Lock and Load to talk to us in person about stuff and sometimes learn things that are uh, a little bit secret. Mm -hmm. So to get back to the game here... I, uh, I like that um, uh, Convergence player shifting gears. <laughs> yes. That's a nice, nice just little pun. audibly said out here, time to shift gears and come down here. So that's awesome. Uh, but kind of what I was talking about, this, this line, right? Yep. We're seeing a line of models forming right here. And then we've got a couple models, like this one's a little too far back. But remember, these things do have counter charge. Uh, so these Bane warriors are going to have to be very careful about how they approach these galvanizers. Yep. Otherwise, these guys can counter charge in and kind of keep forming this wall to lock people out. I would not be surprised if this corollary ends up moving up here for the same kind of idea so it can counter yep. charge up and close holes. Because that wall there is going to complicate things for those Bane warriors on top. Absolutely, absolutely. So a lot of uh, the scenario play that's going on here is is beautiful. It's it's really great positioning. It's really great, uh, really great tactics here. But now that we're down here on the the bottom half of this board, this is where he needs to be a little more aggressive. So he was in the back arc of this bane. All right, pushed him out of the way here. He's pushing this bane warrior out, and we're going to see how much work he can get done here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the bane the command range for these banes at the moment. But I know it's pretty low. This guy may have just gotten pushed out of command here, which, mm -hmm. if it did happen, would be very, very beneficial. And an easy question I can answer, uh, ask from Whiskey WMH, which I think stands for War Machine Hordes. I would imagine. Asking about how to get those privateer press dice we're using in those trays. Those are exclusives we sell at cons. They are a pack of six casino dice, one red, and five blacks. They are individually numbered because they are made by a real casino dice company. <laughs> and the six is a gold privateer press logo. So if you see us at uh, Gen Con especially, or any of those other shows, we, we tend to make up a batch fresh for some of those. They come in a little gold foil wrapper, makes them look like a candy bar kind of. Mm -hmm. And we use them in the stream especially because visibility. Because we want everyone watching to be able to see what the dice rolls are. And if people use their own personal dice a lot of times colors and size and stuff will interfere with that so we got those trays set up, set up with their special cameras so everyone can see exactly what's happening all right our transmitter emergency projector is walking on up 
with its million little tiny legs. Turning so that he can, he can get a lot of stuff in his front arc. So, so one of the things that players do with this, and I think why he's turned like this, is because he wants those permutation servitors in front of enemy mm -hmm. models. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a wall of them is pretty good. Kind of a strange positioning here. Yeah. Like it, it kind of doesn't make too much sense to players that don't know uh, what's going on at the moment. Uh, and but that's what's going right on now here. that the that the servitors for that battle engine cannot be hit by those sprays. Correct. Correct. Uh, so it, we went for the five dice here. <laughs> he hit the Desecrator. Yep, he's trying to just burn down that Desecrator. And that Bane Warrior... And that Bane Warrior caught, did not caught see in the coming. middle. <laughs> did not see it coming. It looks like he's getting a Bane Rider and both of those Bane Warriors in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need seven state here. He's going to miss that front one. He'll hit the second one there. And missed the rider. That poor warrior didn't even see it coming with those five damage dice. Yep. So he's got ready to fire two base on that thing. If he puts the servers behind it, he gets extra shots. So he hasn't chosen to do that yet. Not yet. Figuring the two shots are enough to clear things. He's, he's been going all in on the damage. So. Yeah, and if he needs accuracy, he will put some of those in the left forward arc. Oh, unfortunate. He leaves uh, the Bane Rider at four, at, at one damage yep. box. Yep, four damage four that damage Bane Rider is, is a sad. But he does proc the Vengeance rule for them, uh, mm -hmm. which was something just added in, in the CID process. So Got we're going to get to see it in action. Take out a Bane Warrior, easily hit him, and he's dead. And he fails the tough Not check. tough. got some mechanics left here. Looks like we're measuring out some run distances here to see how far they can get into that zone. If you can successfully block off more portions of that zone, it can make it a lot harder for the Crooks player here to really get into that zone and meaningfully contest it. Uh, when you hear a lot of competitive people talk about the game, they'll say things like meaningfully contest. What that means is contest in a way that cannot easily be cleared. So yeah. last turn, there were two or three Banes in there. Uh, Bane Warriors, there, were, there was a Bane Rider. That's not a meaningful contest. That is, mm -hmm. that is a pretty easy uh, thing to clear out. Um, so it looks like these poor mechanics are going to give their lives to make it a little harder to contest the zone in a meaningful way and uh, a little harder to threaten the Transmitted Emergence Projector. Just as I predicted here, we are continuing to make this kind of fort right around this. And uh, that galvanizer actually ran, so it gets to induct its focus back to the corollary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I really like this play coming from the Convergence player here. It's, it's putting a lot, of, uh, a lot of pressure on the Crooks player here. Ah, so what I mentioned earlier about the the Bane model being behind the force and behind the cloud. Yeah. Uh, it was assumed that they were going to kill the one in the zone, so they are going to get vengeance and be able to move up into the cloud, move up through the forest, and still get their line of sight. So yep. that was not a misplay that we had discussed earlier. That was intentional. So hats off. Hats off. There's also some um, conversation in the chat that we should come to Canada mm -hmm. and officially go to a convention. Uh, I will pass that information along indeed. to our convention manager about... Private Your Press going to Canada to a convention. And then he will decide that. <laughs> oh, he's he's giving me an answer, but it's not it's, it's not a it's not a stream appropriate answer. Yeah, it's not a stream appropriate That's answer. That's for sure. <laughs> we'll high five later, Oz. It's fine. Yeah, there's a, there's <laughs> there's a couple of people asking for the Southern Ontario mm -hmm. Open. Um, I'm gonna uh, Roan Lore. I'm gonna go with Roan Lore as the way to pronounce that name. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Aggie is in here, too, asking us to come to the great mm -hmm. frozen north. Mm -hmm. All right. So we might have a bunch of Canadians in the chat right now. There's a lot of people asking for that, so they're in Terry Open. It is a, a very popular show. You guys should have just came down here with Tim Banky and attended Lock and Load. It would have been we great. We would love you to, to come. 
So we, we talked about time a little bit earlier. And if mm -hmm. you look here, I was saying things that Aaron... Are, things are different now. Aaron Will was the... Uh, was the first player of the game. So it was okay that he was down a little bit on time. Uh -huh. But now he is starting the top of a new run and he is up 10 minutes on his opponent. Mm -hmm. So being the first player, meaning you have taken more turns than your opponent and having so much more time is amazing. Yep. It really And part of that is because the clock does flip when counter charges and those kind of things happen. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so Aaron so Allen has burned a bit more of his clock during his opponent's turns. So that is something uh, that I think the Asphyxies player here can really used to his advantage. He can start putting the screws to his opponent, uh, not only on scenario, not only on attrition, but also on clock. Uh, and a lot of players, when they do get lower on clock, start to get frazzled, they start to get a lot really nervous and start making mistakes. And that is one of the, the big things for playing in tournaments, is being able to keep your cool and not worry about it too, too much. Yeah, and the Privateer uh, Press official representative in chat has answered a bit of that question. And we do understand it is, it is expensive to travel internationally, even if it's just crossing a border between part of North America and another mm -hmm. part of North America. Mm -hmm. And when I say we'd love to have you, you know, don't feel bad if you can't come. But uh, I do believe that the Axis player has scored a third control point here. Uh, I believe he was able to clear that zone. Let's have somebody try and check that up and see if we can get that updated on the stream here. It, it does look like that top zone has has no Crix models in it. Mm -hmm. All right, looks like Derek Wraith. Uh, so we got a couple undamaged Galvanizers up there. Uh, the Bane Riders appear to be assessing where they want to go to try to uh, put a little more attrition fight onto this game. Mm -hmm. Yep, still pointing out damage on Galvanizers. Mm -hmm. Numbering your models when you're running 12 of them is really, really handy. It's a good idea. Speeds things up, especially late in the game when some models have been damaged and some models have not been. Sounds, sounds like we are, yeah, we are confirming that Aaron Allen did go up one more point during the last round, so he's ahead through to zero now. So at this point, I think uh, Scenario is an option for Asphyxius. Not looking great. Mm -hmm. uh, Axis is just so far ahead that it will be very difficult to contest for so long to be able to win on Scenario. Uh, I think he's going for the attrition play at this point. Yeah. He's going to try and kill everything. And I think he's got a pretty good shot at doing it. His Bane Riders are in excellent positions. Uh, Vengeance really helped out with that. It really let him get into the different charge lanes uh, and s have really, really solid target selection. Uh, I really, really like this Vengeance that occurred down here at the bottom. This Vengeance yeah. let him engage those three models, and that is fantastic. That is exactly what he wants to be doing with these Bane Riders, using that new two-inch melee that they have now yep. uh, to stop this these shenanigans out of the Axis player here. Thinking about moving Asphyxius, but uh, <laughs> changing his mind and going to somebody else that needs to go first. But then he saw the tap and he was like, no, maybe yep. walking towards that thing could be a bad yep. idea. <laughs> but he's got the time to think about these things because he is so far ahead on clock at the moment. Yeah. He can take his, take his time. Looks like his... Uh, Southern Bane Warriors down here are activating. And they've got a charge. So because of this Bane Rider that vengeanced and engaged all those Galvanizers, he can really just kind of do whatever he wants on this side of the board. He doesn't have to worry too, too much uh, about the counter charges, about his positioning. It is now m much more open. Uh, the Ghostly here is allowing these Banes to move through the building, uh, through the obstruction that's there. Checking line of sights, it yep. sounds like. They're, they're confirming line of sight here. Here we go. I believe that is the officer, so he will have two attacks. And then the banner is going to run it on back here. Uh, we're now seeing this minifee bringing back D3 plus one guys. He's going to get back two Bane Warriors. Mm -hmm. he's, got, uh, he's got plenty over there for Asphyxius' feet. This pile is looking pretty big. So, it's also a, a very important change from CID for that command attachment is that that ability used to rely on killing enemy models yes. to get you models back. And but we wanted to be more consistent 
and we want the timing of it to be more up to the player that own those models. That is a Ooh. very sad damage roll. Ooh. Okay, it got a little better when he added the fourth die, but still not amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, but that fourth die equaled the total of the three <laughs> dice before it. So yeah, that can be a little rough. That is true. That is true. Uh, but yeah, that change was made specifically for matchups like this one, where they don't have any living models, mm -hmm. so that Minifee did actually nothing. Uh, now it can do a lot of different stuff. All right. So now we did a little bit of damage to that southern or the the galvanizer to the right hand side. This one right here took about six damage to its five. Yep. And, that was and a, now that was a much much better roll taking out that galvanizer. Yeah, and the officer just killed that guy in one hit. Mm -hmm. and the galvanizers are dropping like flies. Double axes. Yeah. Oz, do you know do you know why they call them two axes? No idea. Uh, it's because he has two axes. Okay, cool. <laughs> just in case there was any confusion, to anyone in chat. I think that was a. a cool story bro moment right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that was. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of cool stories, Oz. Right? Yeah. One of the most <laughs> other interesting things about this event, it is the last Steamroller 2016. Mm -hmm. Lock and load in general is the last. So in the future, things like getting behind in points will matter more. Because for those of you who participated in CID, that rule that when you get five points ahead of your opponent, the game ends would be putting extra pressure on the Crix player right now. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it allows for uh, a greater counterplay, right? Because then instead of having to really contest that, that zone up at the top, he could just take his own zone mm -hmm. to, to sort of counterplay against it mm -hmm. uh, in, in SR 2017. Uh, there's also a lot more scenario elements to try and control and take care, yes. take care of. So it, it makes it a more uh, dynamic game in that respect. It's a lot less static. And all of that Steamroller 2017 stuff goes live after Lock and Load. The so Monday after, yes. The season starts at Lock and Load every year and ends at Lock and Load every year. So all of you that are looking forward to those new scenarios where more of those elements are in there and there's different scoring per types of models like jacks and battle engines and units and stuff, that will all be out there soon, mm -hmm. live. So we've got our, our minimum unit of Bane Riders here is charging in, putting some damage on these Galvanizers. Uh, he got some impact attacks in there. So they're, they're very high mat, uh, base at 7, which, mm -hmm. is, which is a very respectable number. And then, of course, on the charge, they get the boosted attack rolls. So they're very likely to hit all their attacks. And I believe they're straight up dice, maybe dice off one. Uh, so they're going to do a lot of damage to these Galvanizers. Yes, yeah, so they're going to be dice off one on the charges here. And then the reposition is kind of going to let uh, the Asphyxius player here, if he wanted to, he could have built his own little box. So he could have moved this Bane Rider to mm -hmm. there and this Bane Rider down here and this one to here. Uh, but I think he's he's not too worried about scenario at this point. He, that's not his game plan to win this. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think he's going to be doing that because he's still got to worry about this this tap here. So if he walks Asphyxius into this, this guy might just shoot him to death immediately. So that's not great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I don't necessarily dislike the fact that he... Well, here comes his fixes, oh. his feet. Here we go. Yep. Ooh, he's getting back eight models yeah, for his feet. Yeah, that was a really this, good the roll. Six was, the six was value. <laughs> oh, no, did he? I hear our judge maybe saying something that he doesn't have eight dead. Oh. That would be a tragedy. That would be a tragedy. But I'm, I'm going to guess these, these Bane Warriors here can really, can really put the hurting on this Transcendent Emergence Projector. So... I think if he can take out this Transmitted Emergence Projector, it really, really secures uh, a lead in this game. Yeah, and for anybody out there that doesn't know, it is D3 plus five models that come back from the feet. Yes. So, so the feet is called Spectral Legion. He brings back those models. Uh, they can charge. They have to charge, not can charge. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, at the end of the turn, are removed from the board again. So, so yeah. So we actually only had seven models available yep. to bring back. So unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> but it was more than likely um, good to have brought back the maximum number of Bane Warriors into that unit at the bottom than to hope on the good rolls. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Because being down one model here for the feet and being down multiple models on the board, just hoping that you would roll that 5-6 to get that D3 to be a 3, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's probably too much of a gamble. Oh, man. I'm, I'm interested to see how many of these Bane Warriors are actually going to get there. That's looking pretty far to me. I'm going to guess not all seven of them are going to be able to get to that Transcendent Emergence Projector. There was an X guy on the TEP doing six damage. So, yeah. 
kind of a bit of a spell to soften it up first. And then he is teleporting all the way over there. So I'm I'm a little worried for Asphyxius right now. If if these Bane warriors right here can charge here, great. Yeah. If it doesn't die, Asphyxius is camping it's very few focus right here, definitely in range of this. Oh, and, and I'm not sending, sure. I'm not sure much much he's else. Sending can really some of those feet Bane warriors at that heavy. Oh man, this could. This is a bold play here. This is a very bold play. And uh, an earthquake has shaken our our entire. <laughs> it's an adventure situation. Somebody must have bumped our rigging, mm -hmm. but that's all right. We in, we encourage players to get up there and really get close to the games and experience and Tony, them for themselves. Tony builds this stuff secure. He's yes. he's he's a seasoned professional. Building our uh, twenty foot rail system for the Borge Gate <laughs> event. That was that was quite incredible. Yeah, quite incredible. All right. So I think he sent that uh, that single bane warrior over there to stop the counter charge. Mm -hmm. So that when he sends the other ones at the TEP, that inverter is not going to show up and block a yep. lot of charge lanes. So that was that was very very good play that I didn't even think about. Like that's yep. that's so amazing. There's our, there's that's, our first. That must be what he's doing there. So here comes our first bane warrior. That's a pretty solid damage roll. Looks like he's doing ten damage. Yep. It's got twenty three. It took six from the X grenade, I believe, putting at sixteen. So it's only got six left. So this needs maybe one. Two more Banes should get it done. We've scored a hit there, and that should do it. That's yep. 16 damage with an amazing 22 roll coming out of that. Asphyxius is safe. <coughs> um, this is looking like a very, very solid lead for yeah. Asphyxius here. And with that model going down, most of the Convergence army on the southern half of the board is, is out. It's a couple of Galvanizers down there. Elimination, Servitor. And, and not only is it out, Asphyxius is now very safe. Oh, like yeah. The Galvanizers. Asphyxius, nothing, nothing can really get to Asphyxius now yes. through that army. So, so the, uh, assassinating Asphyxius right now, very, very unlikely. Yeah. Uh, he's coming ahead on this attrition. I'm not sure Axis has enough models left on the northern half of this board to really get back in the scenario game and make sure that he can score those last two points. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see. <laughs> They are having an issue attempting to pause the clock at the moment. Okay. Pause the clock. Got a judge call. So he is looking to get a measurement for this Bane Warrior right here, charging into that guy right there. So they're going to check that out, and they're going to see if he can make it. And that's Travis Marg, Travis our Marg. Um, supreme overlord of all tournaments at Lakamo. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He's also the Infernal Dark Legacy. He is. He is basically everything you can be at private <laughs> Except Express. for an employee. Yes. Well, technically right now he is. Ah, that's true. That's true. He's not a full-time employee, but at cons he, he comes and helps us out. All right. Uh, it looks like he was in range. He wouldn't want to give up that sweet, sweet basement in Wisconsin. Oh, no. That is, he has a very nice gaming basement. Yes. I'm pretty jealous. All okay, right. so... They were checking melee range. Yep. Uh, they determined he was in. A little bit of jumbling happened. So looks like we did 11 damage with another pretty good roll there. 17 on four dice is solid. Mm -hmm. Very solid. Our inverter only has six boxes left. And we still got this unit of, uh, of Bane Riders to go right up here at the top. Look at that. We're going to do some moving telestration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, so Stay here we fluid, go. fluid, man. Here we go. You can handle it. Tartarus is coming up. It looks like he's going to give that Galvanizer, te teach him what's up. Mm -hmm. um, Staying completely in the forest. Um. So Tartarus has Rapid Strike now instead of Thresher. So we actually got better at killing single models and a yep. little worse at killing massive amounts of infantry. Uh, so in this situation... Yep, that one's pretty gone. Good. Oh, man. It's another Galvanizer down. They're dropping like flies over yep. here, Oz. They're dropping like flies. Our Bane Riders still haven't even gone yet. There's, there's a lot of attrition going on right now, and it's very, very solidly in Asphyxius' favor. Mm-hmm.
But do remember that about seven of these banes here in the middle? Well, not about. Exactly seven of these banes. So I think it's all of these ones. Yep, those are all... I don't know uh, about this one right here, but at least all of those ones are yep. all feet banes. Those are all ghosts. So they're going to disappear. Any time now. So this isn't quite as bad as it's looking uh, for our Axis player, but it's still certainly not good. Uh, I think that bane just charged the objective. They're yep. definitely charging. That looks like a run. May have been a charge on a servitor that's over there. Yep, there we go. Here we go. There we go. Looks like the rest of these guys are just running on up to make sure they, they're in formation and moving around the officer there. The chat is still obsessed with Canada, by the way. Anybody wondering who's not watching this right now on Twitch, we got lot, lots of Canadian talk <laughs> and some stinky cheese. Dude, I love stinky cheese. It's my favorite kind of cheese. All right. So that paint is 10 damage to that galvanizer, almost killing it halfway in one hit. We got a second charge on the same one here. Uh, assuming he's in veteran leader from Tartarus, which he is, that will score a hit. Uh, that's another one of those CID changes, man. Mm -hmm. There's so many quality of life. That's changes what I said here. at the beginning of this game. The the Crix player is playing not quite a new army, but a very very f freshly changed army. So if if Aaron Allen's experience with Crix is mostly pre that CID cycle, mm -hmm. he will not be that familiar playing against some of these changes. He might know them all intellectually, but sometimes that doesn't matter when you're in the middle of the mm -hmm. game and you're making decisions and all of a sudden you forget that Bane Riders have vengeance because they didn't have vengeance before. It, it does show that the competitive guys really got to keep up with everything. Yes. And they got to put in those hours. And that's one of the and that's one of the things that I loved when I was a competitive player was constantly keeping up with all the stuff, yeah. keeping up with all the, the new meta changes and all this kind of thing. Uh, but keeping up with CID is very important for competitive players. And like we talked about earlier in one of our Hangouts, our, our goal is always to try and bring everything to the same level yes. so that interesting choices can be made when constructing armies and when playing against those armies. And a lot of the changes to the Bane theme in that CID was quality of life changes to more differentiate each model type from the Bane Riders to the Bane Warriors to the Bane Knights and then to just even out some of the choices and interesting combinations that players could take. Ooh. These, these Bane dice have been exploding here, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that one's a one. Oh, His tough rolls have been pretty much non-existent the whole game. Yeah. Look at that Soul Trapper running into that mm -hmm. zone. Soul Trapper. I'm telling you, MVP Soul he's, Trapper. He's a buddy, that little Soul Trapper. All right, looks like our Bane Riders are finally charging here. That one's on the inverter that I think had 60 points, maybe eight. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember quite exactly how many's left. Uh, yeah, someone in the chat, gentleman general, is asking if the Bane CID is in effect for this, and it did go live. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it went live a couple weeks ago with the battle engine stuff, mm -hmm. the model changes, and then yep. the theme force was released for this show. Yep. Uh, once again, bringing back up time here. Asphyxious player is down to eight minutes. Yep, half of his opponent's time. <laughs> yes. That is, that is enough time for, like, one more solid turn. But he's down 3-0 to zero on scenario. Axis could win this game on clock if the players are paying attention to that kind of thing. So, if, if Mr. Allen here can figure out exactly what's going on and notice that his opponent only has eight minutes left, it is entirely possible that that he can draw this game out long enough, give enough models for him to kill to not lose on scenario, mm -hmm. uh, and draw it out to a clock win here. So Asphyxia, or not Asphyxia, I'm sorry, Axis is tied in right here, which is pretty close to all of these banes. So he wants to stay away from any type of uh, assassination that could come yep. in here. I think moving more this direction, positioning a couple of your models. This guy seems to have lived from this bane warrior charge. Uh, looks like we've got a couple other little servitors over here. Coming over here, keep an axis safe. Make make Asphyxius play a whole nother turn yeah. to win the game. And maybe, maybe he will not be able to execute that turn fast enough 
and he will end up clocking himself on time. Now, uh, what Asphyxius can do to try and stop this is form his fort. We, we talked about uh, the fort up here at the top half of the board, kind of stopping models getting out. If he can just walk back here with Asphyxius, put up some clouds, put models lining this whole area right here, he can just end his turn in 15 seconds. He doesn't really have to worry about losing the stuff on the top, just jam mm -hmm. a bunch of models in there, mm -hmm. make a meaningful contest effort, uh, and stop Axis from scoring points. Okay, so the clock's flipped with less than seven <laughs> minutes so on the quick side. All those, all those defeated Bane warriors are disappearing. Yep, oh, yep. it was that one down there. And the inverter uh, was destroyed. He didn't remove it at the time because there were so many Bane yeah, warriors around. Yeah, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of overlapping of those axes and those chains and whatnot. Uh, so, so we will see what happens here. Uh, and then that is a point for Aaron Whaley. Yep. And, Not a big uh, impact, but... His feet has been used at the moment. Yep. Our display shows it as not being used, but it's used. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Aaron Allen here just made the comment that he is running out of models. Yeah, unlike Axis's feet that lasts the entire round, Asphyxius's feet does not last that long. Indeed, it only lasts during his own yeah, turn. Yeah, those, those models appear, and then at the end of the turn, they are gone. It would be a much, much stronger feat if those models got to stay for a round. All right. Uh, so Mr. Allen here has figured out that this servitor was not engaged by that Bane Warrior and is running to contest. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the definition of a non-meaningful contest. Mm -hmm. uh, this is probably going to be the only model that makes it into that zone. Uh, and this is very bad for the Asphyxious player that that guy was not engaged because, as we said a second ago, his probable game plan is to, as quickly as possible, end his turn and dominate that zone while stopping Axis from scoring in his own yep. zone. Uh, so he's currently at one point. Next turn, if he can kill that objective, he can go up to two points. Three points for scoring his own zone. If he was able to stop this servitor from contesting, he could be at four. It could then put the screws really, really hard on Axis. Yep. Uh, but because of that contest, it's going to take him a whole other round of scoring. So this is this one's definitely coming down to clock here. It's, it's going to be... I'm going to guess it's going to end up at less than five minutes per player Yeah. by the end of all this. Yeah, I think the Crix player's next turn is going to go below five easily. Easily, yes. Especially depending on what happens to that northern zone. If Axis, uh, I mean, he gets a lot of attacks. He has he double does. strikes, so he can attack twice per focus spent. He has beatback, so we can do a lot of really kind of crazy things uh, with all, that, all those rules. So it is possible that Axis can clear the zone by himself. Uh, it's he's, unlikely. He's got a decent um, um, size of impact with his medium mm -hmm. base and one inch range. Mm -hmm. so, so he can he could engage models that are that are pretty far apart. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I always love doing this. This yep. is like the all right. I've got to kill this caster. How do I do it? Yep. Yep. So so it looks like uh, Mr. Allen here has decided that this game is winding down very very quickly. Uh, so he is going to try an assassination, it looks like. And I'm not really sure what he's got available here. He doesn't have mm -hmm. much. Uh, Axis, in terms of offensive spells, doesn't have much. I feel like he's just got Battering Ram. He has range 8, POW 12. He's got no other offensive spells that do damage. So really, I think whatever does end up happening here is going to be uh, very, very dicey, should it work. Mm -hmm. All right. It does so appear no that he has, he's ruled it out. Yep. He's ruled it out as a possibility. Keep that focus for buying extra tax. Yep. And like we said, Axis, one of the few casters in the game that can buy an attack for each weapon mm -hmm. with, with his, his one strike. focus. Oh, no. We've lost you, chat. Oh, the chat went weird. No. I don't know what's happening. I probably bumped it with my elbow when I was reaching across to touch war room things. There's many, many, many screens going on mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> Man, look at the, the cinematic nature of that shot right there. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the Banes just barreling down on that zone. Really, <laughs> really applying pressure there. It does appear we are uh, attempting to find a way to score some more control points for Axis here. It is... Uh, it's going to be pretty tough, I think. 
Naxos does get to do a lot of crazy things. It's especially going to be tough to score points and not immediately die to these Bane Riders next turn. Mm -hmm. So, Aggie wants to know how um, the Guankin is doing over um, there in the other room. I believe that's a Tom Guan playing Grimkin. I, Weird, like, yeah. relationship name. Yeah. Uh, Much like you and Hungerford's relationship name is Hungry for Paninis. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. I, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually know. We've been yeah. here commentating on this game, so I don't have we an are, for, We are literally Tom yards and yards away from whatever's happening back there. Uh, I don't even know what a yard is. <laughs> it's like three and a half feet, right? Mm. Three feet, something three, like that? Three feet. Three feet. Exactly? Three feet, yes. And then a meter is like three and a half feet. Uh-huh. Mm. Oh, for your Canadians, that was Aggie. So meters. We are literally meters, meters away. and meters and meters away. I'm sorry I forgot who I was talking to for a moment. Because yards <laughs> might not mean anything to you. I mean, they don't, if they don't mean anything to you, then how is yeah. the Canadian going to understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so we've got a proxy base going on right here. It is a permutation servitor at the moment. Uh, I would yeah, and Aggie is confirming I should always use the metric system. Indeed. So now I'm going to, like, I don't know, think of something else weird. Like a stone's throw. <laughs> One stone's Tom is, throw. Tom away. is at, at, at least a stone's throw away. Maybe even two. Uh huh. How far is a stone's throw? Besides Depends on the person throwing oh, the stone. Okay, fair and enough. The size of the stone. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I think a creel stone's throw is not very far. All right, so our servitors are moving up here. They're clearing out some veins. Um, it was a reflex server that just blew up there, did some pal 7 blast damage, did not actually kill any of the veins there. Oh, we're rolling box cars for a point, and he rolled the box oh, cars. Oh, box cars. Oh, when you no. need those, when you need those box cars. Oh, that is a tragedy. Oh, killed his own. Oh, man. <laughs> I haven't seen anything like that happen maybe ever. <laughs> yep. You know, you know, actually, maybe that was his plan, because now he can charge over there with axes. In which case, this was not a very, I don't know. He was, not he, a very standard plan. He, he sounded like that was some um, unbelievable laughter that was coming out of him <laughs> yes. right there. There was quite the giggle. You always got to be careful when you invoke dice. I, it's true. You should, you should never say snake eyes or box cards out loud if that's not what you want. Because sometimes your dice will hear and they'll be like, we need snake eyes. Because <laughs> he said snake eyes and they'll give you snake eyes. <sighs> that's amazing. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad I witnessed this live. That's incredible. So now his plans changed a little bit. Yes, yes. Midstream. He, he kind of opened up his own, yeah. his own charge there, I guess. Trying to determine new order of operation for what, what the zone currently looks like. Well, so we can use his corollary. Let's, 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 let's get a little creative here. So, yeah, the corollary So what if the corollary charges this guy, boost to hit, boost damage, and ducks to him? This guy kills this Bane, and then Axis charges here, kills this guy, beat backs, and kills this guy. You can beat back up, mm. even if you kill him, right? Is, am I wrong about that? You have to, no, you, if you kill a model, uh -huh. you cannot be back to right. because it's no longer on the table. All right, here we go. Here's the play. Okay. You ready? We charge up to here. This yeah. guy toughs. Oh. Then yeah. you beat back. So you, so you got to hope for that tough roll, <laughs> just like he was hoping for not box cars earlier. Yes. So, so you charge to here. He toughs. You get your little advance. Is it directly towards or towards? I believe. Oh, it's directly it towards. Directly. My plan is ruined. Yeah, you would have to charge at a different angle to get that. You'd have to yeah. do something weird and have yeah. him, like, tough once and then somehow not be knocked down and then tough again. <laughs> I don't think that's yeah, a good not gonna plan. Happen. It's not, not a gonna good happen. plan. That doesn't work. <laughs> so maybe we charge. We give this guy a focus. He charges here. Axis goes all the way there, which seems pretty far for Axis to charge. That's pretty far without the And feet. then this galvanizer with two focus kills both of these guys, which seems pretty unlikely to me. Yeah. But that would score another point, putting him at four, mm -hmm. uh, which does put um, Asphyxius here at... He, he's got to be real careful. He's got to be real, real careful, right? Because if if he can score the fourth point this turn, that puts a lot of pressure. Maybe maybe that Optifix directive can save the day. Oh. He's, he's turning his little weird wrench. Oh, geez. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check the stats on that because uh, I'm sure that they are, they are terribly low. But All who right. knows? Uh, yeah, I'm guessing that guy's like Matt 4, POW 8 or something. That guy <laughs> is Matt 5, Matt five POW, POW 8, eight. Mm. with his tuning kit. All right. So we are definitely not scoring another point this turn. We just put up a razor wall in front of the soul trapper here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's yeah. not oh. going to work out. Positioning it. Oh, oh. 
asking we have a judge call judge calls about razor razor walls and inductions i mean the razor walls uh, and it's razor uh, walls and can it be on top of the other obstruction uh i am pretty sure it can uh but it will tell us in the rules text for the wall uh anywhere in the spell station control it's just no so it does touch an obstruction yeah or not so no you so cannot yeah. do it it is right on the card And this Confirming with a judge. And this is why you read your cards, guys. Yeah. Because <laughs> a, lot, a lot of judge calls come down to rereading the card. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, it could be these, uh, these players' nerves are getting a little frazzled. They're both down to oh, uh, yeah, just under seven minutes and just under six and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is uh, that's certainly something that can happen here. Yep. Travis saves the day. He is the best. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can see Boar's Gate there in the background. Mm -hmm. That 16 was feet of Boar's Gate. One heck of an event. Yep. <laughs> I have never played in anything like that for War Machine before. So that was, I had a, gr a great amount of fun, and I know a lot of our other attendees did as well. Well, the best thing about that event was just showing off what a, what a narrative focused war game that War Machine can be used to do. Oh, so we're getting the Razor Wall Bulldoze interaction. So he's Ooh, pushing single wound guys. models. Into, into the blender. Yes. Nice. So I may have lied Ooh. about not scoring a control pointer. Earlier. Yeah. This could still happen. This is some very creative play. I love it. I'm all about it. And it looks like we're going to bump these other two guys right on out of the zone as well. So we've got pr some predictions that Aaron is going to win this game. I agree. I think Aaron is going to win this mm -hmm. game. I don't think it was even a, ever a that was from That was from Tarnium. <laughs> Thank you, Tarnium. Uh, yep, so we do have the, the double bump coming out here. And this is going to put him up to four control points. And as I was saying earlier, that's going to put a ton of pressure on the Asphyxius player here. Because for just one more point, one more point and he wins this game. So... The, the contest is super important here. And, you know, there's a lot of Crix models over there, so I don't think he's too, too worried mm -hmm. about it. But uh, So those, <laughs> those uh, Optivex Directive models are running, and he stops with five minutes on his clock. You know, my prediction was under five minutes on both players' clocks, mm -hmm. so I could end up and in And interesting here. observation from the chat, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, or Mrs. or whoever, Kung Hop. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, suggest that they should have asked Alexa, which if anybody wasn't paying attention to the keynote, that is one of the big exciting announcements we made on Friday morning, that we are working with Alexa to, to get her to answer War Machine questions. Yes. Alexa, I, want, I really want to program Alexa to say, read the card. When you say, <laughs> hey, is this possible? Alexa should probably always start with, did you reread the card? Yes. If not, I can answer your questions. So a lot of exciting things happening lock and load in the stream and not in the stream. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of people in Iron Arena at the moment. We do. A lot of people on the, the super fancy terrain tables and a lot of people in the overflow. Which I guess I shouldn't call it overflow. It is, it is the other two-thirds of the room. <laughs> yes, the rest of the room. But when you walk in, you see the fancy, fancy tables that our, our terrain department makes that are used in a lot of photography and that kind of stuff, like Trollkin Villages and everyone's favorite Corvus uh, bridge map, the big six-foot thing that was used in the Unbound photography. Back in Mark II. All right. Looks like we've cleared out basically all the convergence models that could possibly contest uh, the southern zone here. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Crick's friendly zone. So it looks like he's going to be scoring at the end of every turn from now on. Yep. Uh, it's going to be very, very hard to contest that. Then we're going to see how all. long these turns last. Yes. So in Steamroller 2016, you were required to spend a minimum of 15 seconds on your turn. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, this game is going to come down to contesting. Yep. Galvanize is dying. Uh, Tartarus just took out that Galvanizer easily, easily. I'm gonna... The Bane Warriors are charging in there. I'm guessing that there's an Axis behind that obstruction there. 
Here we go. We, we, can, we can draw in the axis here. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I believe axis. Yes, yes. This is going to be steps axis backwards. right here. To get as uh, far away as possible, but still put a little bit of his base in that zone. Yep. Yep. So here we go. We just got a box cars on the attack roll there uh, from the officer. So that is, once again, a heck of a damage roll out of these Weapon Masters here. One of the great things about uh, Weapon Masters is, I mean, one, they just do more damage. But the spike mm -hmm. potential on those dice is massive. Like, when you get four dice, it's way, 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 way better than having two. The average goes up a little bit, goes up about three points. Yep. But your maximum swing goes up a huge amount. Clearing out those last few mm -hmm. convergence models up there on the north side of the board. Absolutely. Oh. So Axis uh, was hit because of the veteran leader from Tartarus again. Mm -hmm. It is a dice minus five on Axis. Holy moly. Another, another super hot roll doing nine damage yep. after every boost. Nine damage field. after taking five off of it. The second uh, Bane where the charged has missed. But that bonus from Tartarus doesn't help that second roll. It does look like this Death Ripper could run into that zone. I'm pretty sure Axis is the only model left in that zone. So he could score that zone as well. Mm -hmm. Trying to decide uh, what to do up there. Yep. Order there was a, uh, an issue on the stream right quick, guys. Uh, the Asphyxious player should have two control points, so we're getting that fixed up right now from the objective being destroyed. And here we go. There's a, a non-charge charge attack on the Optifex Directive that misses. The second guy will hit him. Uh, it's Power 13, so he dies without a damage roll. And Ron Lore on the stream is noticing that uh, Aaron Whaley is running out of time. He's got almost two minutes left. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The clock is going. <clears throat> so the Bane Rider missed the Warcaster there. Uh, and then they're going to reform. Reposition, I'm sorry, is the name of the rule in this edition. And this guy's just going to run on into the zone, which is going to score yep. uh, score the Crix player two control points this turn. He'll get one for the Convergence player friendly zone and then one for his own friendly zone being dominated here. Mm -hmm. His turn is just almost done. It does look like... Putting as many models oh. in there as he can. Yep. There was a, a Bane Rider there. shuffle there. Yeah, a little bit of uh, order of activation. Snafus there. <laughs> Still so running. The Bane Riders is just running to continue yep. contesting. And stops with a minute and oh. 18. It looks like Mr. Allen is conceding the game. And, yeah. He goes up to four points. A, a fantastic, fantastic game here. Some incredible positioning by these two yep. players to and set up counter And alone charge. on the board, it looks like, right now. Yes, yes could not have taken out all of the models in that zone he could to not. score. He could not. <sighs> it looks like Mr. Aaron Whaley is uh, very, very happy <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to have had just enough time to complete this game. So That was a very, very, very close game. It was very impressive, very impressive. I'm Interesting changes. Feet, yeah, yeah. Feet it, uses at the right times. It swung. It swung a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just really impressed. Like the the play for the counter charges setting up, uh, and then the the amazing counter play to mm -hmm. make sure that they were not super effective. So and then the dice giving a point mm -hmm. to your opponent <laughs> when <laughs> one of your own models takes out your objective. Yeah, with with a, a pal seven blast mm -hmm. damage roll. So box cars was one damage. Never say box cars. Got one hit point. Don't do it. Done. Yep. Done. So I'm, I it was incredible. That's 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 great great play there. Uh, just goes to show you that positioning is one of the key parts of this game and is, is super duper important. And we will see what the next game is in a few minutes. That was the end of round two of Iron Gauntlet yes. at uh, Lock and Load Game Fest 2017 mm -hmm. from Privateer Press. Maybe the Grimkin will show up. There's one Perhaps. player out there with the Grimkin. Perhaps. And we'll be back. I am Will Oskunover, the development manager at Privateer Press, and... Uh, this is Will Pagani, my co-host for this round, and thanks guys for watching. We'll be back with more from Lock and Load soon.